Welcome to Scoop and Scale, where we dish up the science and weigh facts about mostly equine nutrition. I'm Michelle Anderson. I spent two decades working in equine media, and I currently create content and help veterinarians and businesses connect with horse owners through my consulting business, Cadence Marketing and Media. I'm a trail rider, dressage rider, and an at-home horse keeper. And I'm equine nutrition consultant, Dr. Claire Tunis of Clarity Equine Nutrition. I develop diet plans for horses ranging from metabolic seniors to Olympic athletes. I also consult for equine nutrition companies. I'm a scientist, dressage rider, and a pony club mom. Claire and I collaborated for years when I was the editor of an equine publication, and she was one of our regular contributors. We'd finish work, but we always had more to talk about. New products, new research, and our own horses. This podcast is an extension of those conversations. It's for anyone who wants to make better choices when it comes to feeding and caring for their own horses. And before we get started, a quick disclaimer. The information in this podcast is general and not meant to replace the individualized advice of your own qualified equine nutritionist or veterinarian. While I have a PhD in nutrition, I'm not a veterinarian and can't give medical advice. With that, thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy the following episode. Jill and I are back today to talk about a class of ingredients that I get a lot of questions about from my clients and that are commonly found in feeds and supplements, pre and post, and also postbiotics. Pre and probiotics have been around for a while, and I feel like folks were pretty comfortable with them and had a good handle on them as a concept. And then postbiotics came out in the last year or two, and things got kind of confusing again. Haven't they always been confusing? I guess. (laughs) A little bit, a, a little, little bit, bit confusing. Okay, yeah, a little bit confusing. And I, mean, I really do, people do find them confusing. So, and I know that you had your battles with your sport pony back when you were living in Colorado. And I feel like he frequently had loose manure. And we tried a number of things that fall into these categories to try and support that. That is true. And I did some research at that time and found it really confusing and found a lot of products that said they had a pre or a probiotic in it. And even though they did, they did not meet the minimum criteria. And it takes a lot of time to research to make sure that you're actually getting something that's going to work. Yeah, that's true. And I think that, yeah, you hit something on the head there with the minimum criteria, and we'll get into that a little bit. But yeah, they don't always have enough in them to be effective. Well, I know that you have a lot of clients battling a range of GI and loose manure type issues. Many have tried probiotics without much luck. Yeah, I think that's pretty common. They're easily available, right? You can often find a probiotic at your local feed store. And I do definitely help a lot of people with issues and it's around the height and gut where these ingredients are supposed to work. And they've often tried quite a few things before they come to me, but many of them haven't really done anything and they're still left with the same issues. And I would say probably most commonly it is related to having loose manure and they've tried all the easily accessible things and things haven't worked. Why don't you think they've worked? Like, do you have any ideas about that? I think you touched on it, right? I think oftentimes there's not enough of the active ingredient in the readily available products to really be effective or they've picked the wrong active ingredient for the kind of issue they're trying to solve. And so the product can't work because it's not the right product for the job. Okay, so then let's start from the beginning with what these things are. Let's start with the probiotic. What is it? Yeah, so there are a number of different definitions for probiotics. I mean, for example, the World Health Organization, they have a definition, which is that it's a live microorganism, which when administered in adequate amounts, confers a health benefit to the host. Probiotics are live microorganisms that hopefully improve your health. Like that's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to improve your health in some way when you take them in the right amounts. And that's the key thing there, right? So things you might see commonly on feeds or supplements, you might see things like Bacillus subtilis, of which there are different strains. And for example, Bacillus subtilis actually attacks and kills things like Clostridia, like bad bacteria, things that we really don't want getting out of control in the horse's digestive tract. And these are pathogenic bacteria, and so it does a really good job of that. And if you don't keep those under control and they get out of hand, then they negatively impact the gastrointestinal tract Another similar one is Bacillus coagulans, and 
that's very common in both human probiotics and we're seeing it in some equine products now as well. Both of those are what we call spore forming. They're actually alive. So they're able to kind of proliferate and release these spores into the digestive tract. And that's sort of how they have their effect. The bacillus coagulans is also a lactic acid producing bacterium, of which there are quite a few in the equine digestive tract. Another common like probiotic type ingredient you might see are yeasts like Saccharomyces, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or there are some other strains. There's another yeast called Aspergillus. You might see that pretty commonly. I see these being included in feeds, sort of the higher end feeds quite often. One clue that it's a live microorganism, if it's a true probiotic, is that it has one or more of these strain names listed on the label. So strain names come in three parts. So if you're going to get technical, it's the genus, the species, and then the strain designation. So for example, it might be something like that Bacillus subtilis. So Bacillus would be the genus, Subtilis is the species, and there's a particular strain called PB6. So you might see Bacillus subtilis PB6 listed, and then you know that that is actually a live probiotic. There are other very common probiotics in equine products fall into the like Lactobacillus category and the Enterococcus category. You'll see those names. Lactobacillus acidophilus is a common one. But there are problems with those. They're not very stable and that makes them pretty ineffective. But you see them on a lot of easily available products and feed, feed labels too. So what do you mean they aren't stable? Yeah, so to be effective, right? So you have to think about how the horse's digestive tract is put together, right? You have the stomach, which is really acidic as the first part. And then the place where all these bugs live and help digest hay is in what we call the hindgut. It's the end of the horse's digestive tract. So whatever you're giving as a probiotic has to, if it's been put in feed or like a pelleted supplement, first of all, it has to survive the rigors of being pelleted, which means it's gotten through temperatures of probably at least 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So it has to still be alive after being subjected to that kind of heat. Then it has to get through the very acidic stomach and still be alive. And one of the purposes of the acid in your horse's stomach is to kill off pathogenic bacteria that it may have picked up by eating out in the pasture and eating by some other horse's feces or, you know, whatever they're picking up bugs from their environment that shouldn't get to the hindgut because if they did, they might upset the balance of the beneficial bacteria in the hindgut. Part of the stomach's job is to kill off those pathogenic bacteria so the question I always have is, is how do we know those live probiotic bacteria we're paying money for are actually getting to the hindgut still alive? And that's the problem with the lactobacillus and some of the enterococcus strains is they're not very stable and they don't survive acid. Whereas those bacillus species I was mentioning earlier, they've gone through extensive research and they're known to A, survive heat, so feed processing, and they also survive the stomach. And so they're much more likely to be viable, is the term we use, when they get to the hindgut where we need them to be effective. Interesting. That was a really good explanation. So what are prebiotics? (laughs) Yeah, so prebiotics are not live bacteria. So prebiotics are, think about like pre meaning before, right? They're the things you need sort of like before you can have a healthy bacterial population. They're the things that bacteria need to live on to survive and flourish and be viable and healthy. So probiotics are the beneficial live microbes that you are surviving in the hindgut and proliferating. And then the prebiotics are non-living substances that serve as foods or substrates that help the beneficial live microbes to thrive. So the various microorganisms living in your gut, in your horse's gut, they prefer different kinds of foods. And so any prebiotic you're taking yourself or that you're feeding your horse is going to support those beneficial microbes, hopefully. And then you're going to have health benefits because you have a a more balanced, healthier, sort of resident bacterial population. So both pro and prebiotics can be effective ways to help manage certain health conditions in your horse. And they can work hand in hand together or you could use one or the other. What do bugs in the horse's gut like eat to eat? <laughs> well, they really like hay, right? They really like they like fermenting structural carbohydrates and things. So most of our, when we think prebiotics, we're often talking about readily fermentable fibers, right? So we're thinking about 
things like mannan oligosaccharides or fructo oligosaccharides, which I realize is a bit of a mouthful, but these are just certain types of carbohydrates that bacteria typically find pretty easy to ferment and break down. You might see them abbreviated on labels like mannan oligosaccharides are often abbreviated to MOS, M-O-S, and fructo oligosaccharides are abbreviated to FOS, F-O-S. Dead probiotics might act as a prebiotic, right? All the goodies that are inside of those probiotics can be helpful metabolites for existing bugs in the hindgut. So I'll admit I'm not a massive probiotic fan because I think very few probiotics that are commercially available for horses have a lot of research behind them supporting that they're effective when they get to the hindgut. But I guess if nothing else, they, they might become prebiotics if they're dead on arrival. And now we have postbiotics. What are those? <laughs> right. As a term postbiotic, like it seems to have just arrived in equine nutrition sort of out of nowhere in the past couple of years. But actually, it isn't a new term. For example, there's this group called the International Scientific Association of Probiotics and Prebiotics. They abbreviate themselves to ISAPP for good reason. <laughs> And back in 2019, they actually got together and they put together a group of experts, folks who specialize in research on nutrition, microbial physiology, gastroenterology. You know, these are mostly human scientists. So they had like pediatric specialists, you know, food science, microbiology people. And they basically reviewed the definition of scope of postbiotics. And the reason they did that was that they were finding increasingly that the word postbiotic was being used both in the scientific literature and in commercial products, but it was being done so inconsistently and without any kind of clear definition. And so the purpose of this panel was to try to get together as a group and say, okay, what is our consensus statement on what these actually are if we consider the science and the commercial and regulatory parameters that are surrounding this term and to come up with a definition? And they defined a postbiotic as a preparation of inanimate microorganisms and all their components that confer a health benefit to the host. Although they need to be, to be an effective postbiotic, they must contain inactivated microbial cells. So that's different from a prebiotic where you can just be giving beneficial fiber. Like a postbiotic actually has to contain microbial cells in it, microbial matter, or cell components with or without metabolites that contribute to observed health benefits. So it's it's really sort of like the goodies that were like that are inside of microbes, basically. Can you give us an example of what might be on a product label that would be classed as a postbiotic? Yeah, so things like yeast extract comes to mind, right? So if you're going to grow, we talked in before about how you could have live yeast, you could have live Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or you could grow that and then basically sort of blow it up and create an extract where you have the remaining cell walls from the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. You would have all the innards and metabolites and stuff that was inside that cell. And together, you can provide that to the horse and it acts as a postbiotic in that case. What are they doing that the pre and the probiotics aren't doing? Yes, that's a great question, right? So they're basically just provide they're providing the stuff that's inside the probiotics right so you're taking this live cell and you're like killing it and you're extracting all the good stuff out of it and providing the cell wall and all the good stuff that was in that cell whereas when you're doing a probiotic you're giving that live cell and hoping it sort of go forth and multiply kind of thing so now that you explained them, and hopefully everybody listening has a better understanding about what each one is, let's talk about some horse owner issues and how you would approach them. I'm going to start with my own pony who suffers from show stress. <laughs> that seems and fair. And who, every time he gets in the trailer, has loose manure, you go to a clinic or a show, loose manure. How does an owner decide what to use if it is a stress-related loose manure? Yeah, I think it, that's a very common problem, right? And I think it's worth mentioning that sometimes it is just that stress or anxiety of going somewhere that actually speeds up what we call the rate of passage of material through the digestive tract. So, I mean, we use that when horses have, you know, a mild impaction colic, right? You put them on the trailer to take them to the vet and suddenly out of nowhere they poop because just that sort of stress of being in the trailer kind of activates the the muscles around the digestive tract and it starts, you know, moving the digestive tract along and so you get manure. And so some of it's that, you get that sped up rate of passage, but some of it is, you know, and I think if you're just 
sort of go somewhere for a lesson and take your horse out and you classic where you gotta lead your horse in the trailer and suddenly it's like got squirty wetter than normal poop leading it on the trailer that's probably sort of anticipatory increased rate of passage but like in your case when you were going away to a two or three day show and now they're there the whole time and they're, they've got loose manure the entire time they're there yes some of that might be increased rate of passage but there's been some fascinating research done where we now know that where well, we've simulated transport scenarios and we've seen that this can quite dramatically change the population of bacteria in the hindgut as quickly as like 12 hours of trailering or 12 hours of being somewhere new, for example, could quite dramatically change not only the, the balance of bacteria in the hindgut, but how stable that is. So we really are actually negatively impacting that hindgut bacterial population in those higher stress scenarios. So providing ingredients that help stabilize the hindgut can be really beneficial. So that help maintain a stable hindgut environment. So I really like like the yeast, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeasts for that, because there's some research showing that they really help stabilize the hindgut. But we're looking at needing like 50 billion CFUs, and that's colony forming units. So again, these are live probiotics. And so they have to go in and form a new colony. And so we measure them in colony forming units. And you're looking at, you know, the research that was done up at Guelph, you know, you really need like probably 50 billion a day. And many products, when you look at them, yeah, great. They've got yeast Saccharomyces in them, 50 million. And it's hard, right? Because they're all at like one ten times, you know, ten to the nine. They're all in these, and I'm really not a, don't love math, right? And I see that, and I'm just kind of like, ah, oh, that's that's a big number. That means it's a big number, but it may actually not be as big as you think. It may only be in the millions. So sadly, you know, do a quick Google search and figure out what that really means. Are you really getting those fifty billion units per day? So yeah, let's just be clear too that it's billion. Yeah, you are going to find <laughs> many many products that have million, and you think. Oh, that's a lot, but it's billion. Billion is the number that you need to be looking for. And (laughs) I say that, I strongly say it because as you read products, labels, when you're looking for this, you are going to see a lot that say million and it needs to be billion. Yes, you need to channel your Mike Myers, one billion dollars. (laughs) Exactly. Make it 50 billion dollars. We just watched that this weekend. We uh, initiated my daughter into the... The wonders of Mike Myers. Anyway, yeah, so that's kind of one of my go-tos for those scenarios. So we're going to keep talking about My Poor Pony, who everybody's going to realize quickly constantly has digestive issues. But I made the move from Colorado to Iowa. And within a couple of weeks of getting here, my pony suffered from fecal water syndrome. And for anybody that has dealt with this, I feel your pain. I understand your (laughs) frustration. I know what the challenge is. Most horse owners find this really frustrating. What works here? Where do you go? How do you even start to figure out what to use? Yeah, so fecal water syndrome is often where they pass normal manure, but they pass like liquid either before or after their normal manure. And it's really gotten common. I mean, I've been doing what I do for more than 15 years and it didn't seem that common when I started and it's really common now. So I'm not quite sure why that is. And I could kind of hypothesize that that's a whole other episode. You know, generally I think of, you know, this is an issue where they're not absorbing the water. They're supposed to absorb the water. Think of the digestive tract contents as like a slurry until it gets to the small colon. And one of the jobs of the small colon, which is the very, very, very end of the digestive tract, is it's supposed to absorb the water back out to make poop, right? So if they're not doing that well enough, then you're going to get wetter poop and you might get water passing. And that's one of the reasons why, as I said earlier, if you have a faster rate of passage, it's passing through that section too quickly and there's not enough time to suck the water out, you'll get loose manure. But this is a little different. This is like liquid before and after the manure. And yeah, it's, it is really tricky and it's no fun washing butts in Iowa in January. I know because we've had that conversation <laughs> and I've had it with many clients too. <laughs> so oftentimes what I seems to be happening is, is that there is, you know, I often think there's maybe a little inflammation going on in the colon and the hindgut is kind of angry and irritated. And so sometimes it's as simple as stabilizing that hindgut like we talked about before. So I'll try the Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast. 
If that doesn't work, there's another Saccharomyces called Saccharomyces bouillardii. I'll try that one. It's a little harder to find. It's a little more expensive. Again, you need 50 billion CFUs a day, but that's sometimes effective. The prebiotics can be really useful. So you'll find a good product that has, you know, the moss and foss maybe and the Saccharomyces cerevisiae in there. Again, sometimes those postbiotics, so the Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast extracts can be beneficial. And honestly, I probably have four or five different things of versions of these things that I'll say, let's start here and give it like two weeks and see where you're at. Okay, that didn't work. Okay, so we're going to try this and see if that works. And so I'll have three or four different things that I cycle through that can help. If they don't work, then often what we're looking at is saying, okay, like this hindgut is really pretty upset. Let's take the load off of it. Let's get rid of the scratchy long stem fiber, which I know everyone's going to go, oh, you know. <laughs> Let's put them on like some amount of hay pellets. And I know people worry about that. But in this situation, that long stem fiber is rough and it's irritating the gut lining. And we just have to calm that gut lining down. And one of the ways you can do that is to switch to feeding some or all of your forage as pellets. Oftentimes, that's very effective. It helps the high gut kind of calm down the gut lining to become less inflamed and things kind of get better. And then you can gradually introduce some hay back in and you can often end up going back to all hay again. Some horses, you end up with some amount of hay, some amount of pellets. I find that in horses, like senior horses that don't have great teeth, it may be that they're now on pelleted hay forever or a chopped hay or something that's a little less scratchy. Just depends on the individual horse, but that is a, can be a very effective approach I'll also do really potent omega-3 fatty acids with those horses. I'll do like a fish oil supplement because of its, you know, they really help support the inflammatory process and kind of help calm that gut lining down. Things like those bacillus subtilis ingredients I was talking about, those can be very helpful. And then something that doesn't, it's not a pre or probiotic or postbiotic, so perhaps doesn't quite fit in this episode, but if we're talking about fecal water, we should probably mention it, and that's butyric acid. And butyric acid is a byproduct of microbial fermentation. So when the bugs in the hindgut ferment hay, they actually generate things called volatile fatty acids. And it's those volatile fatty acids that get absorbed by the horse and then converted into different types of energy. And one of them is called butyric acid. And butyric acid is really helpful to the cells that line the gut lining. They actually use it sort of as an energy source and it helps those cells turn over and what have you. And it's very beneficial. It's been some really good research showing that supplementing butyric acid can help prevent something called leaky gut. And leaky gut is where when you have inflammation in your gut lining, the cells start to pull apart. And instead of like them being nice and tightly connected together, they drift apart. And so again, you start ending up with inflammation in the gut lining. So that butyric acid can be really helpful for that. So that's something else I'll look for. And that's, you know, often in some of the higher end feeds out there. So I might change the clients, sit on a balancer, I might change them from a company that doesn't include butyric acid to one that does, for example. I might change them from a balancer or, or a senior feed, for example, that doesn't have the bacillus subtilis in it to the one that does. And so these are the kinds of things that I'll do to support those horses with fecal water syndrome and other just hindgut issues. I just want to add on to the naysayers about the pelleted diet. <laughs> when you have a horse that has fecal water and it's been going for six weeks, three months, you will do anything to make it stop. And luckily, I didn't have to get to that point. But these horses are miserable and the hair is missing. They are raw. They are covered in manure all the time. It is so frustrating. And again, I was lucky that I didn't have to, but if, if that's what I had to do, that is what we were going to do because it is such a challenge and so frustrating to deal with. Yeah, no, it really is. So what are other scenarios that you find yourself recommending pre, pro, postbiotics? Yeah, the other big one is probably when I have clients that want some sort of immune support for their horses or a horse is just showing that it maybe needs immune support because of other health issues it's got going on. Because I think we forget that the gastrointestinal tract is the largest component of our, of our immune system. And if you don't have a healthy hindgut, then you're going to have, like we talked about, like 
inflammation in the lining of the gut and that kind of a thing. And that's going to then lead to immune problems. Again, like that bacillus subtilis that I mentioned earlier, it's really cool. Like on an agar plate, if you put E. coli a stripe of like, and you actually like you put a stripe of this bacillus subtilis on the agar plate, and then you try to cross it with like E. coli across itself at ninety degrees. It repels the E. coli. It actually secretes a protein that will destroy things like E. coli, and therefore we don't then have those pathogens binding to the gut lining, causing inflammation and and causing an inflammatory response and or a, an immune response to the fact that the body's going danger, danger. Like I've got E. coli connected to my gut lining. That's a bad thing, right? And your immune system kind of goes wild. So all these things that we can have as ingredients in feeds or add to the diet can help with that. And do I think every horse needs them? Maybe, maybe not, right? I mean, if your horse has a a stable hindgut and doesn't have loose manure and isn't showing any issues, maybe you don't need these things. But as we mentioned in our last episode about showing and being on the road a lot and stuff, we now know that you know, this is really stressful and we're getting the research that's showing, like I mentioned earlier, like trailering can really change your microbiome and it can stay changed. The horse's microbiome can stay changed for seven days after like a 12-hour trip in a trailer. So if you have these horses having these ingredients in the diet on a daily basis can be a really nice insurance policy. Well, that's all the time that we have. Before we go, what do you want listeners to take away from this conversation? I think they, I mean, these ingredients are exciting, right? They can be really powerful, but they have to be in the correct form. They have to be in the correct quantity for the purpose that you're using them for. You have to be an informed consumer. You need to do your research. You need to read the product labels and understand what you're really getting per serving. I mean, University of Guelph has done quite a lot of research into probiotics anyway. I mean, they pulled products off the shelves and then did analysis on them. They didn't have, some of them didn't even have the bacteria in there that they said they did because they did analysis on them. So, you know, buying from good quality companies that you trust is really important. I want to say some of them had like come up with names for bacteria that aren't, don't even exist. I mean, it's it's a minefield out there, right? So buyer beware. But, you know, look, if it's a live bacteria, look at the CFUs on the ingredient list. And then, you know, look for feeds that are using research proven versions of these ingredients in their feeds so that they're part of your daily root program. And then they're in there every day. And then maybe you add something extra, like for you, Jill, like when you go to a show, you add something extra. You start it a couple of days before, you do it while you're there. When you get back, I'm an advocate, do it when you do deworming. Anytime you have your horse on any kind of antibiotic medication, if you're giving NSAIDs for a long period of time, if you're treating your horse with ulcers with GastroGuard, because we know that stomach acid has a purpose and is supposed to kill off pathogenic bacteria. So if you're giving your horse a long series of products that decrease the acid production in the stomach, it's possible that things are now sneaking through and getting into the hindgut where that shouldn't, that are then changing that hindgut microbial population and possibly creating a different problem. So that's another time that I might use something that would stabilize that hindgut environment or that would, you know, like that bacillus subtilis that would actually grab those pathogens and take them out of the digestive tract before they can do anything bad. So they're pretty neat ingredients and I, I think they have a lot of power and yeah. Try and get them in your horse's diet every day at a nice insurance level and then find some quality products for times when you have added stress. For our listeners, if you'd like to be a part of our conversation, please send your suggestions for future topics and equine nutrition questions to info at scoopandscale.com and is spelled out. You can also find Claire at clarityequine.com. And if you enjoyed this episode, we'd be thrilled if you'd share it with your friends on social media. And be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. For the Scoop and Scale podcast, I'm Jill Jackson. And I'm Dr. Claire Tunis. Thanks for riding along with us.